Hey, everybody. Uh, Every wait, Cat Health Foundation. Wait, wait, is... wait, wait, wait. Go. Hey, everybody. My name is Steve Dale. Welcome to this conversation we're about to have about feline infectious peritonitis. Uh, what I want to know is if you can see me and hear me, because apparently we're having some technical issues beyond our control. So uh, if Peter Cohn says he's in, thank you, Peter, then everyone must be good. Peter Cohn has done so much, uh, Zen by Cat, to contribute to where we are today, which is part of what we will all talk about today. So my name is Steve Dale. I'm on the board of directors of what was once called the Win Feline Foundation and is now called the Every Cat Health Foundation. Same organization. This organization, and we'll talk more about this and everything else about FIP, uh, has for decades, I haven't been on the board that long, maybe 15 years, but for decades and decades, have been funding dating back to when Dr. Niels Peterson first began to identify what became, it didn't even have this name at first, feline infectious peritonitis. And along the way, it's been, I don't know if you could see my hand here. If there were a curve, it would be like this. There was no straight line. There was no immediate understanding at some point. And it continues. The story could be a soap opera. In fact, someone told me that a couple of people are actually writing a book about all this. <laughs> Can you believe it? To learn more, <coughs> excuse me, about the Every Cat Health Foundation, it's everycat.org. Do you have a cat? I assume many of you do. And pretty much everything we know about that cat, whether you're a veterinary professional, thank you veterinarians for joining in, a technician, Love technicians, thank you for all you do. A cat parent, a cat fancier, or just someone who knows how to spell the word C-A-T. Everything we know pretty much about those C-A-Ts, those cats, has at one point in time been funded by this nonprofit, the only one like it in the world. And uh, it's been around now for nearly 60 years. So the, it's wide ranging from diabetes, news about feline hypertrophic cardiomyopathy around the corner. That's the most common heart disease in cats. And again, because of everything we have funded over the years, many kinds of cancers, uh, how cats actually, what the neurotransmitters are saying when they suffer pain. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on, including at one point in time, uh, about medications and how they work in cats, including the kind we're talking about today. Uh, and it's good news for FIP, perhaps. I've got two experts who I will have a conversation with. Uh, but first, we're going to go to the man, hopefully most of you are in the room, that really all of you said, I want to hear from this guy. The guy who says in the United States, we are compounding a pharmaceutical available for cats. It's been done in other countries to treat feline infectious peritonitis. Here's my conversation with Michael Tursey. Michael Tursey is the CEO of Stokes Pharmacy. And I'm so glad you are here, Michael. Thank you very much for doing this. As you know, there are so many questions. I want to start off with the easiest, perhaps. Who are you? What is Stokes Pharmacy? My name is Mike. I'm one of the owners of Stokes Healthcare, which consists of Stokes Pharmacy, a 503A compounding pharmacy located in New Jersey. Why FIP? You have other products for dogs. You have other products for cats. Why this one? Yeah, I was approached uh, about a year ago by the owner of the Boba Group, who had been working on this product for several year years and has had so many questions and, and uh, requests for, from, I'm sorry, veterinarians in the U.S. to sell the product. And his license did not allow him to sell in the U.S. So he looked to have a partner here in the U.S. that could bring the same quality of the same medication 
that he had been using, tested um, to provide to the U.S. market. He came out, visited us on about two occasions um, to do his due diligence to make sure that he found a partner that could keep up the same quality that he had been doing in the U.K. and in Australia. And it's been uh, there in both of those countries for some time. Uh, there clearly is interest in that, in this issue. You must have found that out like instantly. So Nick Bova did give me some heads up, um, gave me a lot of the background, his his uh, conversations with, with Gilead, his conversations with regulators in both Australia and in the UK. Um, and it, it, it was not exactly what I thought. It's much bigger. Uh, then uh, he gave me, um, it led me to believe. So Gilead is the pharmaceutical company that originally created the compound. Do you have uh, their permission to do this? Are you using their compound? If not, of course, you don't need the permission, but I understand that you are, but I want you to confirm that. So there has been some conversations with the Boba Group and Gilead, um, don't really have concrete and, and definitive information on it. But my understanding is that Gilead is really happy what's being done with the product. It's not obviously interfering with their human sales of the product, and we would not do that. They just weren't interested, or did they have the time really to do anything officially in the animal health market? So what you're saying, I think, is that Gilead is going to just look the other way. That's our understanding of it. So you're they a have a, They have a big picture. You know, they have a great product in uh, Ramdesivir, and it's very beneficial to all of us that need it on the human side. And so they have not, um, to, to the best of my knowledge, had any issues with what we're doing on the animal health side. So you have... Your company has not personally reached out to a Gilead? We have not directly. Okay. Uh, the FDA has said, this is kind of not so legal, but we're going to look the other way. That's their statement. That is a paraphrase. Are you concerned about what the FDA has said? Or you told me in a prior conversation that they might even reconsider that statement, if I recall correctly. So what they were stating was that all compounded medications from bulk substances for animal health is considered by the FDA to be illegal. And that's that's a longstanding uh, stance that the FDA has had, but they've also had a stance that they will not take enforcement action. That in itself is confusing. And I think what I said to you is that could be a, 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 tele, a, a whole conversation for about three hours on that topic. Um, but what the FDA's concern was is they thought we were being misleading, saying that our product was approved. And by no means are we stating that this is an approved FDA product. It is not. It's a compounded medication, just like the billions of dollars we spend every year on compounded medication. It's, it's just another one, uh, just like that. Unfortunately, the FDA sees it as illegal. We have reached out to the FDA. They have um, offered a conversation with us because we believe they're misleading the veterinarians um, because the black market companies are now taking that same statement that you mentioned and trying to scare veterinarians saying, don't use the GS from Stokes, it's illegal. Ours is illegal, equating them and saying, well, if you're going to use an illegal product, you might as well just use ours. And One I thing. know for a fact that the FDA is not intending any veterinary to use a black market product. Of which there are more beyond FIP, which similarly is a whole other conversation, even spilling over to human health now more than ever before. Uh, but yes. Another conversation. Yes. So this conversation, one clear advantage, I suspect, and actually I want you to explain, how will this work? So uh, a kitten is diagnosed with FIP by the veterinarian. Does the veterinarian prescribe and then you send to the client the product? And do you have enough product 
to send for a kitten that's diagnosed today after June 1st? Yeah, so that's the million dollar question primarily because we don't know what the volume is going to be. We don't know how many cats are undiagnosed with this condition, but we are preparing for a high volume. We feel comfortable that we will be able to supply um, all the cats that need it. But to answer your first question, yes, we, we will get that prescription from the veterinarian. There's multiple ways they can send it in. The old-fashioned call on the phone, speak to our pharmacist, and we have some online, online methods as well. Those prescriptions come into our pharmacy. We, pretty, we get them out the same day, 80, 90% of the time, and owners will see it in one to two days. But also, since our conversation, Steve, the FDA had requested that someone re recommend this for the uh, guidance for Industry 256, which permits these products to go off issues in most states. And it was submitted by three different groups, including us. Um, and the FDA acted very quickly and put it on their under review list, which means we can also sell this product for off issues, so those same veterinarians can start that patient instantly. They could they could give them a pill right there in the office, starting them that day, send them home with some pills, um, which we think is really great. We believe the FDA will approve it and put it on the positive list so that we will be able to continue to stop veterinary hospitals across the country because even a two-day delay sometimes is too long with this disease. So we're happy that the FDA saw the need there and they have permitted it to go off issues. You said pill. So this is not an injection. This is a pill. Is it a little micro pill? Is it a tiny pill? In other words, can people get it into their cats? It is compounded. So it tastes, in this case, I understand like tuna, but these kittens are so sick or, or adult cats in some cases, they don't have an appetite in general. So talk about that. Yeah, so it's a very tiny pill and anyone can look at Stokes Pharmacy's website, stokespharmacy.com, where they can actually see it in comparison to a dime. It's a fraction of the size of a dime and it's a quad tablet. So many cats, especially small kittens, are only gonna be using a quarter of that tablet, especially when they start. Um, so these are the exact same size and the exact same tablet that have been used in the UK and Australia and, and they're the same cats basically. And they've had no issue with the, uh, yeah, it, it is tuna flakes, Steve, you're correct. Um, they haven't had it, I haven't tasted it, but you know, <laughs> I've been told it's good. Um, and uh, we haven't seen any issues in those countries. And you have ways in which you can advise uh, cat parents and veterinarians can do this too. Uh, veterinarians have been doing this for a long time uh, as to how to actually get the pill in the cat and assure, because as you mentioned, missing one dose makes a difference. So if the cat spits it out, that matters. Yes, um, there are different methods of helping get it in. There's even ways of making it into a slurry. Um, it's gonna, you know, we hope to one day have maybe the ability to study this and look at a liquid form for cats because it may make it easier. In compounding, we're so used to making any strength, any form, any flavor, but it was really important to us and really important to Boba that we keep to this tablet strength of 50 milligram quad tab because it's the tablet and the formula that has been used in all of the clinical studies. And we just didn't want to mess with that. We, we just didn't think it was worth changing that significantly because then we don't know about the stability. We don't know about the potency. How does it change? These are things that would take so many years to actually study to make sure it's right. So basically, we're not trying to rock the boat right now. We want to get a product that has been tested, we know works, and let's use it. Uh, Mike, uh, right now for... Uh, Kittens who have FIP, the only choice has been previously the black market uh, in the U.S. Uh, many issues with that. But one issue that we thought might be an issue turns out not to be. The products overall really do work, uh, according to several published peer-reviewed studies that are out there. However, if the product doesn't arrive, what do you do? Is there an assurance that the product will arrive? 
Uh, then you meet someone in a parking lot somewhere. And that's kind of work. Thank you, FIB warriors and others who have made that work. It's not the right way to do things, of course. I mean, veterinarians are still, in some cases, concerned about recommending anything, anywhere that has anything to do with the black market. Uh, and also ability to follow up. So if there's a question of some kind, any type about the medication, use of it or whatever it is, you can't reach out to a Chinese company as a veterinary professional or as a consumer in America. All of those things, I presume, are reasons why you're in this game. Yeah, we, we want this care to be back in the veterinarian's hands. That's where it belongs. They're the experts. They're the ones that can treat and best answer all the questions that the pet owners have and treat these cats properly. Um, it's I've heard some of those same stories. I uh, just heard yesterday about meeting in the parking lot. I thought that was really scary. But, you know, Stokes Pharmacy is a light, we're licensed in every state in the country. Um, we're a highly regulated industry. We are PCOP accredited. We've been compounding medicine for human and animal health since the 90s. The pharmacy opened in 1975. My partner and I have owned it since 2002. Um, I guess the bottom line is we have a lot to lose on the table. We're doing this the right way. The black market companies, they have nothing to lose. If something happens, they just look the other way. And, and I, I've seen so many horror stories about the bad. I've also heard a lot about good. So I definitely think the good there probably outweighed some of the bad, but that's all the only stuff I've seen. But now we have an alternative that veterinarians can take back control of this, and they are the best people to take control of the of the care of these cats. And also to be clear, if a veterinarian or a consumer has a question, uh, Stokes Pharmacy is available to answer those questions, unlike the Chinese companies. I, I believe that is the case. And they are answered by pharmacists. We have like 15 or 16 pharmacists uh, on staff doing different jobs and available for both veterinarians and those patients that have questions. Um, here's the million dollar question, dollars. How much is the cost of this going to be? And and early on, you didn't know if it would be once a day or a twice a day, I think. Yeah, so there's still some clinical studies looking at the difference between the once a day and twice a day dose. Um, it, 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 I, I'm not sure if the conclusion is out on that. By the way, I am not one of those experts um, so I'm not the one that can give this advice on that. As far as pricing goes, we look to try to get the best price we possibly can, and we'll continue to look at lowering the price when, when we can. Um, the price is listed on our website, so anyone can go to stokespharmacy.com. It's it's there for everyone to, to see. It depends on the dose. It depends on the number of tablets a veterinarian will prescribe, because it will be in their their choice as to what what a patient will get, um, and and anyone can see those prices. Are you meeting the Chinese product uh, product prices? It's really hard to compare a product to the black market because you don't really know what's in it. So I'm not really going to answer that question because okay. it's not really possible to answer in my opinion. Anavive of uh, pharmaceuticals, I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, they have a product right now. They're waiting for the FDA waiting and waiting and waiting for FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine to approve. Once that is approved, which will be next year or the year after, I hope, I hope tomorrow, but I don't think it's happening tonight. Um, then what happens with you? Do you remain here or, or do you say, okay, there's something else out there? Yeah, so that's really going to depend um, on, on the product when it comes out. Is there a medical benefit of the compounded version of GS versus this new product. Our stance has always been when it comes to animal health compounding, we always recommend veterinarians choose that commercially available product that has gone through much more testing than the compounded product. And only if there is a medical need to go to an alternative should they. So when that product comes out, we actually think what we're doing right now is going to help that product um, kind of change it so that we're fighting the black market companies now. So hopefully by the time that product comes comes out on the market, they won't have to deal with that. 
And once again, to be clear, you're manufactured uh, not only in, in the United States. I think New Jersey is part of the United States. Yes, it is. <laughs> and you're in New Jersey, right? Yes, we are. All right. Michael Tersey, uh, CEO of Stokes Pharmacy, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Steve. Well, that is the interview that that is the interview that uh, everyone wanted, uh, and we got it. Uh, and uh, Michael Chersey made himself available to the Every Cat Health Foundation, for which we appreciate. Uh, he is now, uh, as we speak, at a veterinary meeting, and he didn't know his availability, so I wanted to be sure we got him since he was willing to talk. I tried to ask him some tough questions. Uh, speaking of questions. If you have any questions, and I see some have already begun to ask or comment, uh, you can do so in the Q&A section. But first, we want to have a conversation, and we'll do that with an old friend of mine, Dr. V Dr. Vicki Thayer. She's been doing all of this for 45 years, in human years. Uh, background in feline medicine, for sure. Graduate from Washington State University's College of Veterinary Medicine, Dr. Thayer is board certified in feline medicine by the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners and was the principal owner of Civic Feline Clinic for 20 years in Walnut Creek, California. Dr. Thayer has contributed to guideline articles on feline retroviruses and was the co-chair person and panelist for the 2022 publication of the American Association of Feline Practitioners, Every Cat Health Foundation, FIP Diagnosis Guidelines in the Journal, of feline medicine and surgery. She has written and currently updated a chapter for uh, medical history and physical examinations for the CAT Clinical Medicine and Management, a book I've also contributed to. Dr. Thayer joined Every Cat Health Foundation on the board in 2008. She became executive director 2014 through 2018 and is director emeritus of the Every Cat Health Foundation as we speak, but she's not alone. We also have Dr. Petra Cerna. She completed small animal internal medicine residency at Colorado State University in 2023. She graduated from the University of Veterinary Sciences in the Czech Republic in 2018, where she also obtained her PhD in 2023. She completed a small animal rotating internship in Glasgow, UK in 2019, and small medicine, small animal medicine internship at the University of Edinburgh in the UK in 2020. Dr. Serna has a particular interest, that's why she's here, in feline infectious peritonitis. Okay, so we welcome, welcome both Dr. Serna and Dr. Thayer into the room. So I am going to begin at the very beginning and I will ask Dr. Thayer this question. Many of you watching are so educated about FIP, you can walk down the street, meet a stranger and say, did you know I know about feline infectious peritonitis? Let me tell you. Or you walk into an elevator and you give them the elevator speech about FIP, but still some of you may not. So let's start at the start. Dr. Thayer, what is FIP? FIP is a viral infectious disease um, caused by a, an alpha coronavirus, an RNA virus, and it creates a, a very severe immune-mediated disease in usually younger cats, um, but it can affect middle-aged to older cats. And up until recent years, it has been a relatively fatal disease for those cats that um, develop FIP. You were not there, Dr. Serna, but uh, at the University of California, Davis in 2019, it's one of the greatest moments maybe in my life because I will always remember. We had a room filled with Dr. Niels Peterson's, if you will, wannabes, uh, in that you had all of these experts on feline medicine from around the world, Dr. Thayer was there, who at one time or another participated in studies or written uh, scientific papers about FIP. And the consensus in that room, 2019, University of California, Davis, led this group by Dr. Niels Peterson. 
and I'll say his name, I can't say his name too often, for his contribution to science, first of all, including dogs, by the way, uh, and other infectious disease in cats, but particularly FIP. And uh, I was able to make the announcement to say, the consensus is from here forward, FIP is now treatable. And I wanna add one more thing. So I looked up and I may even get emotional again, you know, to my right, I happen to see a friend uh, of mine, Dr. Elizabeth Collin, and tears were streaming down her eyes. And then I looked around the room and all these veterinary professionals, hardened veterinary professionals, uh, as well as pet parents were in the room and others, readers, who, same thing, tears in their eyes, and never thought that this day would come. Having said that, the day has come, and in America, we still, maybe until now, and I want your take on this, aren't able to do, and you are, all, everything about you is international, we aren't able to do what many other countries are able to do for their cats. Sorry, are you, is that a question? <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, being European, it's been very hard, I think, for me to watch Australia and UK and everybody, of course, being able to offer so many options when it came to treatment through veterinary practices, while the country where this all actually started, right, in the United States, uh, was unable to offer kind of treatment that, many or most veterinarians would feel comfortable providing to cats. And I think this is now the biggest difference between, you know, because there were a lot of studies looking into what the black market drugs actually contain. And, you know, I think we still need to realize that we have treated thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of cats throughout these years through these black market drugs, right? So it's not like suddenly this is a new drug that is life-changing for the cats. It is the same drug. However, what I think is really changing in this profession is now veterinarians can prescribe this drug. They don't have to worry about losing a license. And I think this is hugely going to impact the quality of life for these cats because they can be brought to the vets. Veterinarians should feel now way more comfortable discussing the treatments with the pet parents and offering these options and also monitoring of potential side effects or complications as well. So I think this is what is changing the most at the moment. And I want to back up a little bit, uh, Dr. Thayer, to what you described as to what FIP is. So at one point in time, and I think many can legitimately argue today as well, FIP is sometimes underdiagnosed and sometimes overdiagnosed. Not necessarily still, even today, getting it right. First of all, do you agree with that? And secondly, if you do, without getting too crazy scientific here on us, why is that the case? It's a very, um, I do agree um, that it can be overdiagnosed in many instances and underdiagnosed. Um, it's a complex disease that has um, different forms and sometimes it can shift between the different forms, what we call effusive disease to non-effusive disease to ocular and even neurologic forms um, that can be very subtle and can oftentimes progress slowly and have very small changes. So it can be difficult for veterinarians to maybe pick up on that. Um, I would say cat parents probably pick up, you know, on these changes much faster than uh, we might see, you know, be, because of course they're around their cats more often. Um, so, it's a, for me, it's a case of, you know, the more you see of, of a cat or cats with FIP, you have a better understanding 
of, you know, how to diagnose it, what you're looking for. But unfortunately, there are many, many veterinarians out there that may not see as many cats and see as, you know, all the different iterations that we might, uh, or I call it many faces of FIP and be able to kind of narrow down what do they need to do. And hopefully with the guidelines or, you know, and there's a lot of educational information available um, that they can learn, you know, what they need to do and get a, a better idea, you know, how to proceed with these cats. Because the quicker you can diagnose them or feel comfortable you know, that it's more likely than not with FIP, you can start treatment much quicker and that's much better for the cat. And I wanna talk about the urgency of starting the treatment and what that treatment looks like and what we know about that in, in a moment. Uh, by effusive, just to define terms, you're talking about the cats that almost look like they have a beer belly. So, and, and Tuesday, they may look fine, this kitten typically, and on Wednesday, not the case. Uh, and visiting the veterinarian quickly when that happens is important as well. Uh, I wanna talk, cause you were there, about the One Health story. And then I promise to get back to FIP, but I'd argue, Dr. Thayer, if it wasn't for the board of directors, which, either you were on or the executive director at the time, forgive me for not nailing down the year and remembering, but you were there as was I. So uh, if it were not for the board of this organization, if it were not for Dr. Niels Peterson, I mentioned it again, you see, but if it was not for him, and uh, at that time, a pharmaceutical company called Gilead's who said, yeah, we're willing to give it a try, we would not have one of the treatments that we have today for uh, coronavirus in people that's called COVID-19 or the illness as a result of that coronavirus is called. Can you explain what the heck happened and what that really wonderful story is? Well, I would probably even go back a little more in time uh, with hepatitis um, C. Um, disease in people because that's where a lot of the antiviral medications started becoming available for people and seeing people that were suffering from that disease responding so quickly. And I think that's where Gilead started looking. And then uh, Dr. Peterson, you know, clued in that it, because he was looking at this long before even we had COVID-19. And so, um, you know, these antivirals, what has come through the human pop, you know, uh, medical field and treatments have now translated and we can use for cats. And, you know, that's, I think, accelerated, you know, our ability, what we have here. And, um, you know, and it can be vice versa. You know, there can be many things that we do and treat for cats or diseases that can translate back, you know, to people. But there's no question he could see the value and and people in the human medical field. The One Health concept is is incredibly significant, you know, in our world. And when the pandemic hit, yeah. uh, human physicians and the human medical community. Uh, I mentioned this to Dr. Fauci personally, actually. The human medical community was desperate and and was now, as far as I know, we're not cats. And actually, FIP itself is not the coronavirus. It's a mutation thereof, but still desperation. So looked at all the studies they can look at, and it's Dr. Peterson funded by the Every Cat Health Foundation, uh, who studied first for cats with FIP with remdesivir. And they did a clinical trial very quickly, they being the National Institutes of Health. Uh, the results were good. And remdesivir has helped to save countless thousands of lives. And if it wasn't for the organization you're still a part of, I'm still on the board of, uh, Dr. Niels Peterson, I said it yet again, as well as kittens getting FIP in the first place, 
we wouldn't have likely or looked at remdesivir, which was a drug that pretty much failed for the Ebola virus, which is what it was for, presumably, and just sitting around. The drug sitting around, Dr. Serna, was not made available to veterinary professionals in America. The pharma company said no. This is, and I can't get into legalities with you because that's beside the point and not the purpose of this. But you just heard the CEO of the company say, we don't have sign off on it. We're just using it. Uh, but it is not the responsibility of the pet parents or the veterinarian to even know that whole story, is it? Yeah, I think it's always very sad because I think when I still remember when that study from Dr. Peterson came out. So it was the year I finished vet school. So not that long ago, but I personally have lost breeding cats, actually several of my own cats and kittens to FIP. And I will never forget the day I read that paper. But I was it just changed. I think I just could feel how the future of FIP was going to change and how we no longer will be giving death sentence to these kittens that are four months old and are supposed to live for the next 20 years. And suddenly, you know, they are, uh, we have to euthanize them because there was no option. So I think, you know, that paper, probably if you ask me about a life-changing experience from a, being a veterinary student or then an intern, this was the paper that I knew was going to change kind of the field of feline infectious peritonitis. And then, you know, I think I understand why, of course, human pharmaceutical companies wants to preserve the drugs for humans, because of course, it's a much bigger business, much bigger market. Unfortunately, I would always choose to help cats over humans because it's just who I am. And I uh, always will love cats more than people. <laughs> but I, of course, understand that if there were side effects in cats, for example, then it might uh, affect their approvals of those drugs for humans as well. So I understand, but it was heartbreaking to see after that study was published that suddenly the drug wasn't available for, for the cats. And I think it was, yeah, it, it, and our hands were tight. And, you know, I, I know Dr. Niels Peterson has tried very hard to make that happen, to actually have the drug uh, available for, for cats worldwide. And uh, I am really grateful that there are other ways these days that we can actually uh, treat the patients. So Dr. Serna, kitten tomorrow is identified correctly with uh, feline infectious peritonitis. How quickly must you get uh, this new product, the compounded product into the kitten, or do you need to do an injectable first with more serious, if you will, forms of FIP? I think that's a great question. So we, of course, I think Dr. Thayer mentioned that uh, before, I think it's really crucial that we start treating these cats as soon as possible before they, of course, develop worsening of their clinical signs. I also love the questions with orals versus injectable medications, because I actually uh, really like the oral medications in the patients that are stable, that are still eating, and they're otherwise clinically quite well, because we have no evidence showing that the injectable medication would actually be uh, better than oral medication. And we know, unfortunately, that a lot of the cats from the injectable medications have severe side effects in those skin ulcerations. It's quite painful because the solution is so acidic and it just, uh, the skin and the subcutaneous tissue just doesn't like the acidity of the products. But I think there are still cases where if the patients are very unstable, they have not eaten for days, and especially cats with like neurological form that they might have problems swallowing and so on and so on. Maybe in those cats, the injectable might be uh, worth it. We also should realize we have the remdesivir now, FDA approved uh, fully for humans. So veterinarians can actually prescribe remdesivir even intravenously. I have used the remdesivir from Gilead intravenously in several of my uh, critical FIP patients that were hospitalized in hospital for several months now. So I think that's also another option that we have a fully FDA approved drug that we can actually prescribe uh, 
kind of off uh, off label right for cats if they are very sick and they need immediate uh, treatment and and just to be clear prescribing it off label has nothing to do with being illegal uh, many medications in veterinary medicine for decades and decades and decades and decades for dogs cats and other species are used off label every single day and that's very common it's fine uh, however i do want to ask you something about what you just said about remdesivir it has it become, because I'm told it is difficult to get. Uh, secondly, it is so darn expensive, I am told, where the choices from Stokes or the online injectables, uh, which actually have gone down in price over the past year or two, uh, are not as expensive or nearly as expensive. Yes, absolutely. Last time I've purchased it, uh, we usually have to get it through inpatient human pharmacy in a hospital. So we cannot give a prescription to the owners and they can just go and pick it up in a pharmacy. Most of the times I've been getting these there through uh, inpatient human pharmacy where I had to go as a veterinarian or someone from our hospital had to go and pick it up uh, ourselves. Uh, I think the benefit of it, uh, it is darn expensive. The bottle was over $500 and it only lasts about two, maximum three days after reconstituting. And you are technically only supposed to use it for 24 to 48 hours. But I think the good benefit of it is that it's actually sterilely made and it is safe to give intravenously because it is actually for intravenous use in humans as well. Mm -hmm. um, in other nations, the product, Dr. Serna, that has now become available, the compounded product from Stokes, was originally created and still is from a company in the UK called Bova. To my knowledge, and by the way, uh, Michael said that the cats in Australia are the same. Well, they have pouches. Our cats don't have pouches. But beside that, they get <laughs> the same way. Uh, and the studies demonstrate, again, to my knowledge, I want to ask you if this is true, though, that, in fact, the compounded product not necessarily being used with anything else is is good. It works. Uh, I don't know what the efficacy rate is or not. Maybe you know. Yes. Uh, so we give usually with the compounded GS medications, we usually give about 80% success for the cats. Uh, so which going from 100% almost lethal to 80% success rate, I think that's amazing. There are definitely differences between the forms of FIP. So we tend to see worse response with the severe kind of neurological cases compared to like the effusive cases. Those are tend to be a little bit what we probably call easier to treat versus the neurological forms. That is why we also have different dosing for cats with different forms of FIP. So this is very important. We still see some relapses. And unfortunately, we, of course, still see some cats that do not respond to the antiviral at all. And interestingly, when, again, bringing up Dr. Peterson and his study, his success rate was actually much higher than what we are seeing now. And I think we are potentially also noticing less response. And I think this might be because we might be seeing some resistance to the GS or remdesivir in these cats. Which brings me exactly, thank you, to the next topic. So, Dr. Thayer, you were there when Dr. Peterson, you know, he actually predicted the pandemic in a way, by the way, uh, because he said that this is going to happen, coronavirus he was talking about, he was explaining what the coronaviruses are at the very, very beginning, and he said, we're going to see a new one on the human side. It, I don't know that you remember that. It was almost like an offhanded statement. I've got a recording of him saying that, actually. And what do you know? This brilliant man was right about that, too. He should be working for the U.S. government. Sorry, Dr. Peterson, if you're watching, because I know he doesn't want to work anywhere at this point. All right, Dr. Thayer. He also said that ultimately we are going to, because of resistance and because of what coronaviruses do, and we've seen this with so-called COVID-19 on the human side. We are going to need multiple drugs. I know that's begun to happen. Do veterinarians yet know what that cocktail should look like? Well, I think hopefully if they've been listening to a lot of the ed, you know webinars and educational um, discussions that have been out there that 
we've tried to to uh, promote the fact that a potential um, cocktail of maybe three drugs, that's one thing that he is, uh, Dr. Peterson has discussed having three antivirals um, legally available in case we do develop resistance to, um, you know, the coronavirus or FIP virus. And, you know, we've got now it looks like one, um, we have others that are on the horizon, uh, what with Anavive, and uh, then there are the EIDD uh, drugs that unfortunately are still not, they're approved for, P, you know, it, emergency use in people, but unfortunately that doesn't mean we can um, legally prescribe them for cats, uh, but they have had benefit uh, and certainly in situations where like Dr. Cerna has talked about cats that are a little more unstable, tougher to treat. Some of those cats who have not um, essentially responded to uh, GS form or remdesivir will respond to say like molnupiravir, which is one of the EIDD forms. So we need at least more, certainly more drugs. We need to be um, cautious. And I think Dr. Serna, it, this is one area that I agree with her strongly about on trying to prevent resistance development. Uh, amongst, uh, you know, cats um, you, utilizing these drugs. So, you know, it's, it's very important that we still evaluate our use and treat the cats that, you know, have FIP really need it, but don't just use it broad spectrum, just like we did with antibiotics. And now we have resistance to, um, you know, like staphylococcus infections, strep infections. So we want to be very careful. Uh, in fact, thank you, because you lead me yeah. to the next question just perfectly <laughs> so. So in an effort to do the right thing and an effort to not have kittens get FIP proactively, some breeders are treating kittens that probably have the coronavirus, though they may not even, and assuming this treatment would prevent FIP moving forward. Is this a good idea, Dr. Cerna? Yes, thank you. I am very, very glad that we can discuss this a little bit today because I actually strongly agree that this is not a good idea. <laughs> because if you think about coronavirus or feline coronavirus, uh, we know that about 90% of cats in multi-cat households will at some point come into contact with the coronavirus. It's just ubiquitous to feline population. We know, you know, it's there is no way we could ever get rid of this virus from feline population. It's just there. And treating in majority of these cats, 90% of those will actually never go on and develop any clinical signs, never develop FIP, and they will live happily ever after. Most of them will stop shedding and they will not even be infectious to other cats. There are some cats that will be shedding persistently. So I think it's some one population of these cats we probably need to look at a little bit more from both immunological and genetical standpoint as well. And we need more studies looking at those. But actually giving kittens uh, antiviral medications, preventing the shedding, in my opinion, doesn't make any sense at all because then they go are rehomed to new homes where there are other cats who are very likely going to go and infect those kittens. And then if those kittens actually go on and unfortunately develop feline infectious peritonitis in the future, we currently do not know how efficacious the therapy will be if they were already exposed to the drug when they were kittens. And one thing that uh, some veterinarians are working on is a potential vaccine to prevent coronavirus in the first place, which by the way, friends, you know, people have said, and I want your take on this, Dr. Thayer, we don't need to support every Cat Health Foundation anymore, not at least for FIP, because all the work is done. Uh, well, I don't think we're sadly anywhere near that yet. It's great that it's potentially 
in the United States, potentially, elsewhere, definitely, no longer, uh, for nearly all kittens, a fatal disease. It's treatable, but better if it were preventable. And we've got to better understand that cocktail that we've been talking about of, of treatments as well. So can you comment on that, Dr. Thayer? Um, definitely, because I strongly believe research is incredibly still very important. Um, I do a lot behind the scenes to, you know, help that happen. Um, there are a lot of things that we may think, you know, we have the answer now and that's going to solve the problem. But, uh, you know, viruses and uh, you know, they mutate, they do, you know, they change. Um, and we have to learn, you know, how to deal with it, uh, you know, as that happens. And, you know, we don't, there are a lot of questions. We don't know uh, what the re cell receptor is for the most common serotype, serotype one, um, FIP, uh, FIPV. And so, you know, it helps to have answers for like that to develop vaccines. Um, it, certainly prevention is very important because this is a global disease and there are countries out there that don't have access to um, oral, the oral medications. They may need something else or there are a lot more community cats that are acquiring the disease that you can't medicate for 12 weeks. We want to try and prevent the disease, you know, in those populations. So there are so many questions and it always seems like the more we learn, the more we need to learn in my opinion, so. Yeah, well said. And I, I do want to take questions and we'll do that next. Uh, but first I want to take this opportunity to Thank all of those, and maybe some of you, I know at least one of you watching, who have participated to make a difference. And Dr. Thayer, you're one of those superstars who have done that for many, many years. Uh, and some of you are watching. I know Peter Cohn, Zen by Cat. He had a cat affected by FIP, who Dr. Peterson helped to save. And ever since then, his mission, I think, Peter, your mission in life, perhaps, is to raise money as well. Uh, the Every Cat Health Foundation has a fund specifically geared, and you're welcome to give money if you'd like, to FIP. It's called the Bria Fund. Susan Gingrich is the woman who had a Berman cat whose name was Bria, who began that fund uh, back in the day, but still not all that long ago. She worked her tail off, sort of speak, to raise dollars successfully, uh, because this is such an emotional issue, in part, I guess, because it happens to mostly kittens. I mentioned, everyone here has mentioned numerous times, Dr. Peterson, but there are so many other veterinarians as well around the world. And I can't even begin to mention their names because then I'll leave out a bunch who have contributed in significant ways. One of those veterinarians, by the way, a part of this isn't only research, it's also communicating to other veterinary professionals what we know. And there's a name that I know that Dr. Serna knows well, Michael Lappin, who has done that for a lifetime. And one of the talks he gives, and I've had the pleasure to speak with him many times, and I enjoy it for a lot of reasons, mostly because my last name begins with the letter D, I get top billing but he's an amazing speaker and he communicates at veterinary meetings all over the world about lots of topics, including uh, feline infectious peritonitis. So I just wanted to do that shout out to also my colleagues on the board of Every Cat. Uh, this is a huge event and it's not the end all be all. And some of the comments as I get to the questions here now suggest and I'm not going to read those questions word per word, but I want you both to comment on this. They suggest that in some way we're targeting the Chinese companies or FIP warriors, who I think earlier I called heroes for what they do. Uh, and I believe the people that run these groups are heroes, 
saving so many kittens. So I'm not quite sure how that's been misconstrued, but can you comment Dr. Serna and also Dr. Thayer? Yeah, absolutely. I think we really need to realize that these groups have been helping cats for years now, right? Because we did not have other any other option to treat these cats until very recently through compounding pharmacies or prescriptions. So I think what these people have been doing, and most of them actually have been you know, investing money back into feline infectious peritonitis research. Most of these groups have been actually working with veterinarians, and I personally work with several of them on actually doing retrospective studies, evaluating kind of the efficacy, but also potential side effects of these drugs in these cats as well. So I think it was just the best way that we could still treat cats, because honestly, if you ask me two years ago, if my cat had FIP and I lived in the United States, am I going to let my cat die or I'm going to, you know, try to do my very best to help my four or five month old kitten that I want to die when it's 21 year old of CKD, not that when it's five month old of feline infectious peritonitis, I would have probably used the same way. I think I am very grateful that we have now an option where we can make this a little bit more known between veterinarians and like this FIP treatment stopping to be this taboo that everybody's afraid of, that they're going to lose their licenses and so on and so on. But I definitely would like to say thank you to everybody who has until now have been helping to, you know, treat these cats, because I think on a lot of their side, it is a lot of their time and personal life dedication too, right? Because they talk on Facebook and emails to thousands of owners of cats with the lethal disease that are going to die. And so I would like to say thank you to them as well. And I want Dr. Thayer to weigh in on that. But first, uh, are we still going to, and it's in at least one of the questions here, are, are we still going to need the injectables? It seems we are. And in what will their place be? What will the compounded medication place be? Do we have an answer to that, Dr. Serna? Uh, for the injectables? Uh, do we are we yeah. still needing the injectables and what yeah, I, how how does this work and even a veterinary professional balancing okay does this kitten get the injectable does this one get the compounded medication at what point do I transition etc. Yeah, I think that's a great question, and I think we actually do not have any big studies that are comparing the efficacy and success rate of the injectable versus the oral. I personally believe that. From the studies, especially the newer studies that have come out out of UC Davis with Crystal Reagan's group that took over Dr. Peterson research there, the oral medications are actually perfectly efficacious for these cats. I think, like I mentioned before, for all the stable cats that are still eating, feeling well, I think for those, the oral medications are perfectly fine. Those neurological cats and those really severely sick cats who are maybe even laterally recumbent, are not swallowing, eating, and so on, maybe for those, the injectable might be for at least first few days, potential an option. But I don't think we need to be giving these injections for 12 weeks because a lot of these cats we know feel so much better within 20, 48, 72 hours. Which is like a miracle in itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Dr. Thayer, same original question uh, for you as well. Sure. sure. You know, I, I totally agree with Dr. Serna. Um, the, you know, the groups, um, the individuals that have been helping over the last five plus years, uh, you know, I think have been to me invaluable. I certainly would not want to see any cat suffer and potentially die of it have said over the years uh, or the past recent years that uh, I believe they should be treated. Uh, many of these individuals have given so much of their time, you know, dedication. Uh, I'm a strong proponent, I guess, uh, because I have a family member who had a chronic illness or cancer and saw in the human field how um, they bring people together and, and you have really kind of a whole care 
support team. And that's what I'd like to see. I'm happy that veterinarians are now back into the conversation and we need to be involved, um, but we need cheerleaders. And these, this group, these groups have been great cheerleaders for cat parents. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that we can all work together to be a whole um, care team you know, for, for these cats. And, and like Dr. Cerna mentioned, there have been thousands, you know, I hear the figure up around a hundred thousand, you know, cats that have been treated and uh, doing well. You know, you want to see the cats back to being normal, regular cats. And, and, you know, that's such a pleasure and it's always, you know, great to see that cheerleading. Indeed. Um, I'll get to a few more questions, If uh, and I apologize for going over time, but I do want to ask a few more anyway. Current protocol for the FIP treatment is to give the meds at the same time every day for 84 days. Is that how this new pill will be handled or communicated to pet parents, Dr. Serna? Yes, uh, we currently are still treating or recommending treatment for 12 weeks, but uh, I'm actually now at ACVM conference and we are discussing a lot with a lot of uh, specialists from all over the world and we have a big discussion on this topic tomorrow. There are going to be studies coming out that I know of uh, from several different countries actually showing that potentially six week, uh, sorry, six week therapy might be as efficacious as 12 week therapy. And if you think about this in human medicine, they actually only use these antivirals for like three to five days. So I think we are going to be doing more and more studies into looking potentially into shorter therapies, especially in those more stable, effusive, you know, cats compared to maybe the ocular neurological that might need longer therapy. So there are a lot of studies actually into this underway, but the current recommendation is still 12 weeks. But I uh, presume this is going to change in the near future. I think you need to make a house call, Dr. Serna, for this next question. <laughs> I, am, I am currently treating my five-month-old kitten with the Stokes formula. I started treating him with the black market meds seven days prior to obtaining the Stokes formula. He started responding to treatment right away. He's been on the Stokes formula for days. It doesn't say how many. He's had good days up until yesterday. He just seems to be a little less playful than normal. Uh, after being on meds, the play has come back. I just noticed a decline in the past couple of days. So is this normal is the question. We do not see that very often. Most of these patients just really are rapidly getting better. So if there is a decline, I would probably have him reevaluated by your veterinarian uh, and see what might be going on because we have definitely seen one, resistance with the GS medication, of course, and two, we potentially can also see some of these cats developing different form of FIP while still on therapy or relapsing already. So he might need an increase in the dose, for example, or if he is developing additional um, comorbidities like neurological form. I've had several cats that started effusive and then we started therapy and a couple of days later, they actually developed neurological signs. So we again had to increase the dose. So I would suggest that he gets re-evaluated by a vet to potentially discuss if uh, increase in the dose might be needed. Was anyone aware of the news before of a certain group announced it? I hate stemming this topic has been hard and embarrassing for some. I felt that people were left off of the announcement. I'm not sure exactly what they're saying here, but I wanted to address that question. Uh, maybe Dr. Cerna, you can answer that because I think that it may be a surprise to some. That's why we're here to talk to people. Uh, but I, best of my knowledge, Stokes went through the process of doing the right thing. Yes, I think it was uh, announced on multiple social media and everywhere. I know uh, I'm part of the lot of the Facebook groups uh, with treatment of FIP. And I know everybody has been really promoting and trying to be, you know, proactive and very helpful and excited excited about the new options uh, through pres prescribing through veterinarians. And I think what we need to realize, like, I don't think 
anybody here, you know, we have so many people registered for this uh, webinar. I am here, Dr. Theris here, Steve, you are here. Like we are all here because we all love cats. We all want to help cats with FIP. And honestly, it makes me quite sad that lately there has been all this like, this group is not helping us much. This group is not helping us much. I just think we should all really focus on what is important. And that's helping these FIP cats because honestly, with the resistance we're seeing, and you've mentioned that some people suggest we no longer need FIP research. Honestly, I think this is such a fascinating disease. And now we are seeing, I'm actually researching several secondary comorbidities we see with FIP because in the past, all these cats got euthanized and now they're all living. So we now see months to years later, they're developing gastrointestinal signs. We have cats with gastrointestinal lymphoma. I've now treated several cats with myocarditis, immune mediated hemolytic anemia, secondary to FIP. So we're just learning. It's like patients with COVID, right? There are all these secondary things because Dr. Thayer said at the beginning, this is a hugely immune mediated disease that causes all these secondary changes in these cats. We don't know what's happening. Those cats with neurological form, are they going to go and be completely normal for the rest of their life? You know, I am now doing a study where we look at ultrasonographic changes before and after treatment with antivirals. You would be surprised how many of these cats still have ultrasonographic abnormalities despite being completely normal and we don't find the virus anywhere on PCR. So I think we need so much more research and I think we should just all, you know, live happily as one family that wants to help cats with FIP. You know, uh, based on what you just said, so uh, there's a question here for kittens who have severe neural form, uh, which has been treated successfully. She wants to know exactly what you just said. Are there yeah. going to be implications for the quality of this cat's life? Uh, and could it even affect life expectancy? Uh, the, your short answer is, I suppose, we don't know. Exactly. And actually, it's one of the things I am now working because you know, every cat uh, has a new grant proposals due. So actually, this is one of my thoughts potentially to look into because unfortunately, this is a very expensive study because of how much MRI scans cost uh, these days. But it's definitely one thing I really would like to look into doing an MRI scans before and after therapy as well to see because now my ultrasonographic study is going to show that we are still seeing changes in those cats despite being completely clinically normal. So I think it would be really interesting to look in the same way on the neurological abnormalities in these cats. It's an interesting it's kind of an insider's question, but I'll ask it. I don't know if either of you know why Bova has been able to register GS and Dr. Peterson hasn't. Uh, can either of you comment on that? I It has to do with international licensing or because BOVA's in the UK, I suspect. Well, it's still not yeah. it's still not like registered to my opinion anywhere. So they are just these exceptions to the rules, right? Yeah. How we can now start all using these drugs. But I do not think the drug is actually registered anywhere for treatment of FIP for cats. Right. And I asked, uh, Michael about that actually yeah. and he more or less said well we're crossing our fingers those are my words not his but that's <laughs> essence of of what he said um, has the resistance of GS Dr. Thayer Stokes formulation been documented anywhere or is that speculative if it exists at all I would say it's probably you know I haven't seen any um, detail on that as far as in in any of the papers that have come out, you know, in the last year. Or so, um, you know, it's something it, it, as far as the medication, I'd probably say most of them have ranged around high 80% um, to maybe 91, 92%, you know, cured. Um, so those cats have responded. So it, it varies, you know, but Overall, I haven't seen any definitive. We there is are a couple of studies that are going to be published here soon. One um, with over about seven hundred cats involved out of uh, Munich and Zurich University. So we might have more information once um, those papers are published. You know, uh, it occurs to me. I'm just thinking out loud here. 
Uh, so the Every Cat Health Foundation supports and holds a uh, symposium uh, every year, every other year. Uh, we did so in conjunction with uh, North Carolina State University, their feline health center this past year. Uh, and the focus of that was on, I was there, I should know. Oh, uh, uh, management. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I only helped develop the program. Heck do I know? Yes, thank you, Dr. Thayer. <laughs> I watched it. <laughs> I know. Um, and we have one upcoming on heart disease because there's such incredible news I think happening there but maybe the year after it's FIP again which we've done before because there's just so much to talk about uh question for you Dr. Serna and this could be the last one just for time's sake otherwise we'd be here all afternoon uh Stokes is not the only group that has easily available medications I've been using a product from Mucin uh, that's one of the Chinese companies. So I did not know, and maybe you do, does Mucin offer a chewable now, or are they comparing the injectable still? Uh, I believe they also have oral medications. So a lot of the you know black market products now come in oral and right. injectable form. So we have plenty. Uh, what we need to realize, Mucin, the the organization or whatever you want to call the company making those are not a licensed pharmacy in the United States, right? So they do not have to undergo the regulations and everything, which is the whole point of these drugs now being compounded in actually licensed pharmacy undergoing uh, kind of uh, different controls and, and being able to prescribe them through veterinary professionals because Mucin will just go and sell this drug to kind of anybody, there are actually one of the few sponsoring these shedding studies, which we've discussed is actually probably helping with the resistance of, of the GS uh, antiviral and to FIP. So uh, again, right now, Stokes is the only company or pharmacy actually that's licensed in the United States that has it available on the market. There might be more, I would presume, you know, because Anybody can go and uh, actually now any compounding pharmacy go uh, could go and start producing this. So I presume there might be more in the future, but at the moment it is just Stokes Pharmacy. So for both of you, do you have in 30 seconds each uh, a closing statement, if you will, Dr. Thayer? I would, I'd probably just go back to the concept of please, please support uh, the efforts to try, you know, on research uh, on FIP and certainly any cat diseases um, that every cat health, um, you know, focuses on. But um, just research isn't done. We have everything, you know, keeps moving on and we need to find more answers. Indeed, we do. Dr. Serna. Yes, I would probably say the same. I am extremely grateful that we can uh, treat cats with FIP. It's definitely a disease. I have a love and hate relationship for many years now. And uh, being now a very active young researcher, and uh, I would love to do more feline infectious peritonitis research. And every cat has actually funded several of my projects. So I hope that everybody that's here today uh, it doesn't matter if it's five, ten dollars or two hundred dollars or more. I think, you know, like Dr. Tyre and you mentioned, the uh, future research into the disease is extremely important because we might end up with more resistance and we might need new drugs and we might need vaccines. You know, if one day we can just prevent this disease, that would be, of course, the ultimate goal. So please uh, help uh, with uh, funding for this very important research. I know you have an event coming up. Well, oh. <laughs> I don't know why that's there because I want to talk about your event coming up, which I think we have a slide for. Uh, yeah. But uh, if you can both hear me, and I think you can, I do want to cheat and ask just one more question because I think it's a very good question. Uh, and that question is, uh, are there more side effects with the injectable compared to the pill or the the... the the chewable I'm talking about, uh, the compounded product compared to the injectable. Do we know if there's Dr. Serna one more than the other? 
Yeah, so with the biggest side effect we see with the injectable is the local reaction site. So the from the injection, so these cats get pretty severe ulcerative lesions uh, in the skin from where we inject the solution because it's so acidic. With the oral medications, we see some uh, gastrointestinal side effects, so mainly nausea, potentially hypersalivation, some other gastrointestinal side effects. Uh, but those can be pretty well managed with supportive therapy, while the injectable medications, very often those cats are extremely painful and actually have severe side effects for a really long time and their skin is pretty affected so usually at the moment i as long as owners can pill their cats uh, i prefer to go with the oral medications at least for the long term you know the first couple of days that's always a different story in those unstable cats but the kind of the long-term therapy i always prefer the oral medications and something we also touched on that i want to mention because uh the person who comments here is a superstar when it comes to feline health issues, particularly genetic issues, Leslie Lyons says the data produced by every cat funded projects will be used by the FDA to provide drug approvals, support every cat. Lots to do. Leslie, thank you. Thank you. It is always good to see you, even though I'm not exactly seeing you. Okay, Dr. Serna, you have a big event coming up, but first they want me to promote something I know that every cat has coming up, and that would be the next slide, Virginia. Every Cat Health Foundation is presenting five, not four, not three, but five low stress techniques for feline care. Dr. Sally Foote, who is an expert in behavior, will be doing this. It's race approved for veterinary professionals, June 11th at one o'clock p.m. Eastern time, and that's sponsored by Beringer Ingelheim. All right, the next slide should be, I hope it is, all about your event, which you can start talking about, Dr. Serna. Yeah, oh yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so I am actually organizing a two-day conference. This is mainly for cat breeders, but any caregivers or uh, cat um, uh, lovers are very, very welcome to this as well, because we have a lot of talks. Dr. Lyons is actually uh, giving a talk for us on feline genetics. I'll be giving a lecture on feline infectious peritonitis, and we have a lot of other amazing speakers uh, like Sarah Ellis and Ilona Roden and uh, Sam Taylor on a lot of behavioral talks for cats and how to make kittens and multi-cat households kind of uh, happy uh, for uh, our cats. And so if anybody wants to join, there is a QR code, and I hope to see a lot of you there as well. Yeah, it looks like a great event, and those speakers are indeed, I will confirm, superstar speakers. Speaking of superstars, uh, you know, this is such an emotional issue. And, uh, you know, I talked to Michael offline, Michael Tercy of uh, Stokes Pharmacy, and I don't mind, I don't think he'd mind me saying this publicly. I said, did you ever think that this would be such an emotional issue when you got into, because they provide so many other compounded products for uh, dogs and cats, and I think other animals as well. And he said, no, I've never seen anything like this. There's something about FIP and the road so many of you have taken, in many cases, right along with us. Uh, Dr. Serna, thank you for all the work you are doing, and thank you for being here. Dr. Thayer, you know what we think. You're you're amazing. And I thank you for being here as well. And I thank all of you for attending this. Help all of us to help cats every day at every cat. There's a QR code. And again, I apologize for going a bit over, but I had so many questions. I also apologize to those whose questions we didn't get to, but I thank you all from around the world, actually, for attending. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Thank you. It's been an honor.